Hello. Hi. You're not. Well, this is not good. Well, that's all right. If you don't feel well, we can manage without you. It's going to be a simple meeting. <laughs> if you want, if you want, you don't have to co-host though. You know, just uh, if you want to just listen in, it, it'll be interesting. Actually, you'll be interested because these settlement houses are in our neighborhood. Oh, good. Okay, well, why don't you just listen in? Yep. Okay. Bye. They're quite so close. I look at those eyebrows. <laughs> Something's got to be done about these eyebrows. to change to a different shirt tonight. Hi, Deborah. And welcome everyone to the Landmarks Committee meeting of Community Board 3. Um, our first order of business tonight is approval of minutes from last month. Uh, if those members of the committee would tell me if there's any reason not to approve them. No. Yeah. I approve. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Sandra, are I you don't did? remember seeing them, come to think of it. Yeah, I may not have sent them out, but there was no resolution. It just had attendance on it. Was I, if I, I was in attendance? I believe you were, <laughs> yes. If that's, on, that's reflected in the minutes, that's okay. It's reflected, <laughs> don't worry. Okay, so we, uh, we have a very nice agenda tonight. I think we have the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative visiting us. And we're going to hear a little bit about what's up, what's up with the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative in general, and then specifically about three requests for evaluation that they're working on. So I don't know who wants to start. You, Richard, or? Sure, I'll start. And um, thanks, Linda. Uh, we're going to share our screen, if that's all right. Let me do that for you. Hold on. And I'll just keep my fingers crossed that uh, okay. what happened happens is what's supposed to happen and <laughs> you are a co-host so yeah it's it's always a little scary isn't it yes it's always scary we're an informal group it's when you guys are doing your nice beautiful presentations and things go wrong that's what's really bad <laughs> yeah. i feel well, bad when that happens and it happens yeah. to everybody it's not you <laughs> we, we like everything to work like a dream now i'm trying to <laughs> Play, but unfortunately, the Zoom stuff gets in the way of, oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah, you all set. Well, about the time we master Zoom, it's going to be over, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be fine with me, actually, at this mm -hmm. point. But, um, okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. And I think, I think most of you, or, or probably all of you know us, uh, but I'm Richard Moses uh, from the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative. I'll be pre presenting with uh, my fellow board member, uh, Deborah Y. Um, and it's two part, we give a little background on, on what Lesby is and, and what we do. And uh, that's the first part of our presentation. And the second part of our presentation is specifically uh, to ask your committee for support uh, for landmarking of three historic settlement house buildings on the Lower East Side. So, so we'll get to that very shortly. Um, Lesby was formed in 2007. It's a small uh, volunteer, uh, not-for-profit organization. And our mission is the preservation of the historic Lower East Side, which as you can see on the screen, includes the East Village, Lower East Side below Houston Street, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. And um, we do that uh, primarily through uh, New York City landmark designation, either of historic districts or of individual buildings, uh, which there's no shortage of, of great historic resources in the his historic Lower East Side. So uh, when we first got started, we were really a small group. We're, we're still small, but not quite so small. Uh, and and, and uh, we decided just to have uh, historic districts be our sole mission because we felt like that was something that, that we had the bandwidth to tackle. And so, First thing we went after was uh, surveying of the East Village. And uh, you know, we looked at all the buildings in the East Village and identified uh, the, the areas that we thought would make good historic districts. But before we finalized everything, we decided because there was change was going on so quickly, so many buildings were getting demolished that um, we would go ahead and meet with the Landmarks Commission, introduce ourselves as a group, and then tell them really about what we were uh, planning to do and what our concerns were in terms of buildings being lost before they could be landmarked. And uh, when we met with them, you know, they were all smiles and, and uh, nice words and, and we left and we thought, oh, well, you know, that's that. Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be back to them in not too long a time. But within a, um, a few days, they called us back and asked us for another meeting. And when we came back, uh, a month later for our second meeting, we were thrilled to see uh, that they had were proposing a historic district, uh, which is basically the historic district that you see uh, on the left here. We, we just about fell off our chairs. Uh, mm -hmm. We were so excited. And um, this is a district that goes from uh, the, the current, which is now designated the current East Village Lower East Side Historic District, which I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point. Uh, during the meeting with Landmarks, uh, we did gather our wits about us and, and ask them if they were familiar with the, the block uh, to the north of Tompkins Square Park, which they said that, that they uh, 
you know, uh, because we felt that that was particularly also worthy of, of landmark designation as a very special block in the East Village. And they said they'd look into it. And again, uh, a month later, they told us that they would go ahead and do this. So uh, we joined forces with uh, East Village Community Coalition, Bauer Alliance of Neighbors, uh, Village Preservation, which was then known as GVSHP, and Historic Districts Council, and made a push for the district which uh, got designated almost 10 years ago now. So that was a, that was a big thing for us. And right now uh, we're looking to expand the East Village Lower East Side Historic District um, to the blocks to the north uh, and uh, also expand the East 10th Street Historic District around, the, uh, around Avenue B. Um, and so that's something that's kind of in the works uh, right now. And we've been working again with GVSHP or Village Preservation, HDC, BAN, and EVCC on this. But uh, things are going slowly, uh, as you all know, because of COVID. And so um, we're kind of a, a little bit in a holding pattern on, on this. Now, theoretically, this should be moving. Oh, there it goes. Uh, so uh, once the, the East Village districts were designated, we went about um, surveying the Lower East Side below Houston Street, uh, looking for a district around the Tenement Museum. Uh, we had initially, we, we surveyed the whole National Register District, which goes up to Houston Street, uh, but we found that the blocks between Houston and Delancey, uh, which had been proposed for landmarking uh, maybe seven, eight years earlier, uh, and had never gone through, uh, we found that those blocks uh, we're already too compromised, that, that too many historic buildings have been lost and replaced with either uh, glass towers or some other kind of uh, incompatible construction. And so uh, we, we uh, joined up with Friends of the Lower East Side, uh, identified a district below Delancey Street that, uh, that goes down uh, basically to East Broadway and proposed that to the Landmarks Commission uh, the Landmarks Commission came back to us and said that they would definitely strongly consider it, um, but they had they came back with a smaller district that basically goes from Delancey to Broom Street and from Forsyth to uh, Ludlow, uh, which we decided that we would be happy with. We it didn't fall off our chairs like we had with the East Village, <laughs> but we did smile. So 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 um, they've been working on that, uh, but they're now in hiatus because they feel that. Uh, with COVID that, that the building owners are really uh, too much behind the eight ball uh, to, 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 to deal with um, landmarking right now. So we're kind of in a holding pattern ourselves, sort of looking month to month uh, how we should uh, and when we should adjust our um, strategy to make sure that this district does get landmarked before there's too much incompatible uh, development, which is certainly around the corner, especially now with Essex Crossing having, having been built. So we also looked at Chinatown uh, after we looked at the Lower East Side and uh, we felt that this area is so special uh, in, in the hearts of so many New Yorkers and tells such an important part of the history uh, of New York, which of course the whole Lower East Side does, but, but somehow Chinatown uh, really, uh, the, the history really radiates uh, and, and, and this is a, a contemporary history, I think, as, as, we, as, as we've said uh, in the past, that we're not looking to freeze these areas in time in any, any way. Uh, we want them to continue to function as lively uh, areas with, with a contemporary feeling. So for example, when we propose areas of the Lower East Side for landmarking, we, we encourage the commission to develop very lenient rules for storefronts so storefronts can go in and out as long as they're not demolishing historic materials. Signage can go up for basically what kind of signage that they want as long as it complies with city regulations. And, and we want these districts to run very, very smoothly and easily. Now with the Chinatown area, there's, there's a lot of pushback. We don't have the support of the city council person and um, the uh, building owners are, are, are not excited about it to, to put it mildly. So right now we, we have this on hold, but it is something that we have on our back burner that we keep an eye on. And we certainly would not want to see Chinatown end up to be rows of glass towers with, with Panera breads 
and maybe some McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts thrown in. So uh, that's uh, where we are with Chinatown. Um, recently, we uh, surveyed uh, a, a, the uh, area around Oliver Street and St. James Place, which I, I believe that we uh, showed your committee uh, previously. Um, and uh, that uh, we're also finishing up our research on and then we'll present formally to the Landmarks Commission. And uh, that's something also that we're working on with Friends of the Lower East Side. Uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, we expanded our mission as our, as our, as our group got bigger. Uh, we expanded our mission to include individual landmarks. And so we've created an individual landmarks committee, which Deborah is on. And um, we've been looking at various buildings around the Lower East Side, of which there are many that are, have a, interesting histories culturally, uh, as, as well as, as act, very interesting architecture. So we're, we prioritized uh, a list of buildings to go forward with, which we're gonna bring in in dribs and drabs as we uh, finish our, our research. And you're, you're seeing actually uh, the first three tonight of, of, of our official uh, individual landmarks uh, historic, uh, uh, individual landmarks committee um, proposed buildings. Uh, so it's kind of a historic occasion for us uh, as well. And we do advocacy. I know you're familiar with 70 Mulberry Street. We've been involved in that and co-sponsored events such as the, uh, the um, uh, protest rally that, that uh, you see on the bottom left. We've also been trying to save the two uh, uh, historic buildings in the East River Park, uh, the track house and the tennis center comfort station, which I know you're both familiar with as well. So uh, we do get involved in advocacy and buildings that may be either landmark quality or not quite landmark quality, but are historic and are worth, worth preserving. Uh, and then we do our outreach in various ways, um, which includes, as I said before, rallies, which, which we've done on various buildings. Uh, we, in, the, in the old days, we did live events, uh, such as uh, seminars and talks on various uh, subjects related to the uh, history of the, of the Lower East Side, the architecture of the Lower East Side. We do uh, walking, live walking tours, including, uh, in this case, Chinatown in the upper middle. Uh, we do tabling, uh, which uh, I believe uh, Laura Sewell is, is, I see, is, I see with us tonight. We may be doing, it looks like we're going to be doing some, finally, this Saturday for the first time in, 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 in almost a year, uh, so, or probably more than a year. Uh, and um, this is usually done in street fairs, et cetera. And then we do, uh, uh, in, in the age of COVID, we do, uh, we've done several uh, webinars. And uh, if you're on our email list, uh, you can uh, see when we, we offer these, they're typically uh, free of charge. They have been free of charge. And if, you, if you've missed them, you can see them on our YouTube channel. Uh, they're very, really, really interesting. We've got a bunch of interesting speakers and they are um, uh, uh, available if you search on Google, uh, Lesby YouTube channel. And then finally, we do publications. I have examples here, two that are very close to our heart, East Village Lens on the Lower East Side, Chinatown Lens on the Lower East Side, which are um, uh, photo essays by uh, local uh, contemporary professional photographers, as well as uh, accompanied by brief histories of the neighborhoods by uh, local professional writers. So uh, that's something that we love to get, to, to get involved with. So let me uh, close out of the screen here. And, and Deborah, if you can share yours. That's if, that's if my... Uh... Hold on, I've got to make her a co-host. Oh. Oh. Mm. I'll keep going. Um, what uh, we... Well done. Oh, okay. I can do it now, okay. Well, you're getting ready. Let me ask those of you who are not committee members to please put your name and uh, affiliation in the chat so that I have an attendance record. Thank you. 
Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, LESPI has been surveying and identifying historic buildings uh, that we believe merit New York City individual landmark designation. And this is what we're gonna talk about uh, for the remainder of our time. Uh, our individual landmarks committee has been meeting to establish priorities and decided to focus on three settlement houses of the Lower East Side as the first priorities. The well-known Henry Street settlement was landmarked early on. We have turned to other highly significant social service organizations and the very distinctive buildings they have occupied. Recently, we submitted a request for evaluation to the Landmarks Preservation Commission for the University Settlement, the Educational Alliance, and the building at 311 East Broadway that once housed the Young Men's Benevolent Association, and later the Grand Street Settlement. All were designed by noteworthy architects of their day. And while each has had some modifications over the years, this is not detracted from their original architectural conceptions. Our evaluation requests were prepared by Lesby volunteers, Tom Kim for the University Settlement and Owen Collins for the former Young Men's Benevolent Association. And I see both of them are here uh, with us at the meeting tonight, uh, as well as Lesby board meeting, uh, board meeting, as well as Lesby board member, uh, Phyllis Eckhouse for the Educational Alliance. Lesby advisor, Bruce Monroe took our close up photography. Deborah oversaw this project and now we'll make our presentation. Okay, Linda, do you see that someone's waiting to be admitted? Oh, yes, I do not. It, let me, let me know. In. Yes, no problem. It popped up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he's a lesbian member, so I, re I recognize his name. <laughs> I guess okay. he's coming in that case. Okay. Um, so here, as Richard said, here are the three settlements that we'll be talking about. Um, the university settlement is on the left and the educational alliance in the middle and the building at 311 uh, East Broadway on the right. Um, today, university settlement and educational alliance include various satellite locations in addition to these headquarters. And Grand Street settlement, which moved out of the building on East Broadway, also continues to thrive in numerous locations. The settlement house movement began in London in 1884 with Arnold Toynbee House, and just two years later, in 1886, came to New York with the establishment of what would eventually be named University Settlement. This privately funded movement was one of the progressive era responses to the dire circumstances found in major cities at that time, including rapid urbanization, widespread industrialization, and massive waves of immigration. The densely populated, poverty-stricken Lower East Side was an area of particular concern. The settlement movement was initially fueled by young, idealistic college graduates who came to live in the organization's buildings, in effect, settling there to get to know the needs of the neighborhood intimately. By 1910, there were over 400 settlement houses in the United States, with 100 in New York. The movement declined after World War I and into the 1920s with restrictions on immigration. By the time of the Great Depression, many social programs were being provided by the government through the New Deal. Yet even today, there are 44 such organizations in New York, now often referred to as neighborhood houses. Here's a map of the Lower East Side below Houston Street showing the locations of our three buildings. The university settlement is over here, so it's between Houston and Delancey on the corner of Eldridge and Rivington. Down by Seward Park on East Broadway is the Educational Alliance, and further east at the intersection with Grand is the building at 311 uh, East Broadway that housed the Young Men's Benevolent Association and the Grand Street Settlement. I want to show you now some of the programs offered in the early years at the time these buildings were constructed. These settlement houses provided everything from public showers to childcare and summer camps, adult classes, arts programs, health clinics, and milk stations. Many of the initiatives later served as models for government programs. These pictures at the top from the university settlement show programs for children geared to working mothers. 
University Settlement also had the first kindergarten in the United States. The image below of children singing and waving flags at the Educational Alliance shows the efforts by the settlement houses to assimilate the immigrant population and to nurture American citizenship. From the current perspective, such undertakings are sometimes criticized because of the lack of attention given by these organizations at that time to the native cultures of their participants. <laughs> Programs were also offered to adults, like the lecture seen here at the Educational Alliance. Its library seen at the right was renowned. The collections would eventually form the core of the Seward Park Library when it opened across the street in 1909. At the bottom, here again, you see an effort to aid the assimilation process with an older woman learning to write in English at the Grand Street Settlement. The arts were also integral to settlement house programming. You see here music and dance groups at the university settlement. At the right is an announcement for a concert and dramatic series at the Educational Alliance in 1904-05. This organization was also well known for the visual arts with such figures as Louise Nevelson and Mark Rothko associated with their programs. And finally, here is a gym class at the Young Men's Benevolent Association at 311 East Broadway and a poster from one of their fundraising events. That was a benefit held at a Yiddish theater on the Bowery and featuring the celebrated actor, Boris Tomaszewski. Now we'll turn to the architecture of these three buildings. Here at the left is a university settlement when it opened in 1898. Before that, the organization was housed in various locations and had several names. The architects of the new building were Howells and Stokes. John Mead Howells came from a distinguished literary family as the son of writer and editor, William Dean Howells. His partner, Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes, came from one of the wealthiest families in New York. Stokes would go on to co-author the Tenement Law of 1901 and also produce a remarkable scholarly study of New York City history in six volumes entitled The Iconography of Manhattan. Both architects were trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Here they've designed a building in the neo-federal style, evoking the architecture of early America and meant to resonate, however indirectly, with the immigrant population who came through its doors. There is an elegance and stateliness to its proportions and to the orderly symmetrical arrangement of the elements on its facade. The materials are red brick with contrasting white stone for the base and trim. I'll point out some of the alterations to the building over the years. When the building opened, as you see on the left, it had five stories. Less than seven years later, an addition was needed, as you can see on the right, with a sixth floor. Now, the original cornice here becomes a belt course on the building with the addition. This element will later be removed leaving a prominent band over the fifth floor windows and a new cornice will be added at top. On the left over here, you can see some tenements right beside uh, the university settlement on Rivington Street. But only in 1905, just a few years later, there's this handsome building, which was a Carnegie library designed by McKim, Mead and White. Presently, there's a modern addition going on top of that building and it will house condos. Here's the building today. You can see the wide band I mentioned where the old co the cornice, the original cornice had been. That's over the fifth floor windows. And here's the prominent new cornice up here. I'd like to point out some of the refined detailing of this building, which contributes to its overall elegance. Here on the right is a handsome entrance portico with freestanding columns. The engraved entablature right here, whoop, right here says Neighborhood Guild, which was one of the earlier names of the organization. Above that is this stone panel, which has the words University Settlement House. At the lower left, you can see a close-up 
of the edge of that stone panel, which includes an elaborate torch and swag. And even underneath these tiny peg-like forms, which are classically derived, derived, derived elements that are known as guttai. On the lower right, you can see the contrasting white keystones here and the impost blocks on these arched windows. Uh, let's see, oh, those are on the top floor. No, those are on the second floor, excuse me. And above, a closer look at the cornice and the arched windows, that's the top floor, which have decorative white stone elements in the spandrels and beneath the sills. The image at the top left shows the white splayed lintels over the windows on the middle floors. And these are splayed lintels, these white elements. And also stone panels. There's a panel here and a panel here. These panels depict the official seals of universities. On the left is Harvard, and on the right is Yale, which I could make out by zooming in. There are two similar panels on the Rivington side of the building, but I couldn't make those out. The focus on universities places this organization right in line with the most typical settlement house model at that time, which involved young college graduates coming to live and work in the building. They were usually white, Protestant, and middle and upper class, although there were some notable exceptions to that. These young people were inspired to help ameliorate the very difficult conditions they found in the tenement neighborhoods. Even Eleanor Roosevelt worked at University Settlement before she was married. And FDR called the organization, quote, a landmark in the social history of America. Now we'll turn to the Educational Alliance, which has a different focus. Educational Alliance was founded specifically to provide social services for the Eastern European Jews who flooded the area beginning in the 1880s. Funding came from German Jewish immigrants who had come to, to America earlier and had prospered. They were concerned about a growing anti-Semitism against the new poverty-stricken arrivals and wanted to foster the assimilation process. In the beginning, Educational Alliance did not even allow Yiddish to be spoken, but they changed that policy as the organization became more responsive to community needs. They offered a wide range of typical settlement house programs. Founded in 1889, Educational Alliance opened its new headquarters in 1891. You can see the building on the left, which combines element of the elements of the Romanesque revival style with its strong arches and the Renaissance revival style indicated by the prominent cornice and classical ornamentation. Here you can see the portico entrance on East Broadway and another portico entrance on Jefferson Street. After about 10 years, an addition was added to the east. This is the addition right here. You can see the portico is now one bay in. Today, that addition is barely noticeable because it was designed to match the original style. There was also a new rooftop pavilion added right here. And this, this triangular pediment-like form which was later removed. Much later, after 1969, the entrances were changed. The porticos were removed and arched entrances replaced them in keeping with the arcade-like feeling of the ground floor. You can see the new entrances here at East Broadway. This is the entrance. Then you have the ground floor that resembles an arcade. And here's the entrance on the Jefferson Street side. In 2014, the main entrance was changed again, adding a canopy. This is it, I hope you can see it, little canopy here. And at about the same time, a new pavilion was built on the roof, not visible here. But overall, these modifications do not detract from the architect's original conception for the building. It still evokes a sense of dignity, permanence, and stability, which was surely reassuring to the generations who made use of its facilities. The architects were Arnold W. Brunner and Thomas Tryon. 
Little is known of Tryon's background, but Brenna was trained at MIT and became a favorite architect for Jewish civic institutions and synagogues. Just in this immediate neighborhood, he designed an elaborate pavilion that once graced Seward Park across the street, as well as the Schiff Fountain that stood in Rutgers Square a block away. Rutgers Square was once a great gathering place for protesters of the period. It is now called Strauss Square. And that fountain in need of repair is currently in Seward Park. Overall, this is one of the most historic sections of the Lower East Side. In addition to Seward, Seward Park, which boasted the first municipal playground, it includes a Carnegie Library across from the Educational Alliance, now a New York City landmark, as well as the Forward Newspaper Building, also a city landmark, on the stretch of East Broadway, once known as Yiddish Newspaper Row. We believe the Educational Alliance deserves similar landmark designation. I'd like to point to some of the classical ornamentation on the building. Given its imposing size and strong impact, it's a bit of a surprise to see such care and attention to detailing. Here at the bottom, you see a terracotta decorative element that is repeated across the second and third floors. Its panel is outlined in molded brick. You can see the brick here. Above that is a row of molding along here that is in the classical egg and dart motif. And below, there is fine detailing in the capitals of these pilasters. At the upper right, you can see the egg and dart molding more clearly. And there's also a shield-like form known as a cartouche. The molding on either side of the cartouche is called bead and reel, reel and is often found on buildings with classical ornamentation. And here is another, here's an elaborate uh, capital on this pil pilaster below. Finally, at the upper left, we see the handsome cornice and the bold arched windows on the top floor. The spandrels are embellished with small circular plates known as rondelles. Right here, see the rondelles. This building certainly rewards close looking. Finally, we come to the very distinctive building at 311 East Broadway at the intersection of Grand Street. No one who passes by can miss this building, especially since the area around it has largely been rebuilt since its historic immigrant past. At the time of its dedication in 1905, it was hailed by the New York Times as quote, one of the handsomest buildings in that section of the city, while the New York Tribune called it, quote, one of the showplaces of the East Side. The architectural firm was Sass and Smallheiser, known mostly for dozens of tenement houses in this neighborhood and across the city. Their structures often stood out for their highly decorated facades filled with classical motifs, but none of their previous buildings could prepare us for the dazzling 311 East Broadway. There have been some modifications over the years with a decorative, decorative element at the very top removed as well as the cornice and the porch railing, but the building's singular impact is not diminished. 311 East Broadway was commissioned by the Young Men's Benevolent Association, a group of Jewish men who wanted a place to gather and also to offer social services for the neighborhood. They raised the necessary funding themselves without the help of wealthy benefactors. When the building was completed, it had a library, gymnasium, bowling alley, and meeting rooms. It became the locus of political organizing immediately, gathering protests against pogroms in Ukraine. That association eventually disbanded and left the building in 1918. A more traditional settlement house moved in, called Arnold Toynbee House in honor of the first settlement in London. It later changed its name to Grand Street Settlement and occupied the building for over 20 years before moving to larger quarters. Grand Street Settlement was founded by philanthropist Rose Ruining using her own funds. And during her tenure, 
she did not take compensation for her work. The New York Times in its obituary for Gruening called her the angel of Grand Street, saying that she was, quote, known and loved by thousands of the East Side poor. Among her many personal contributions to Grand Street settlement was the funding of college educations for some of those who took part in her programs. Gruening deserves to be much better known. She follows in the line of other celebrated women who were leaders in this field, including Lillian Wald of Henry Street, Mary Simkovich of Greenwich House, and Jane Addams of Hull House in Chicago. Here are some of the exuberant details of this very unusual building. You see the stepped roof here and here, which is typical of the Flemish, Flemish revival style and also these dormers. And there are white stone elements radiating from the windows, which contrast vividly with the red brick facade. You can see them here and down here. Here you can see a mythological creature who stands watch. At the, at the lower right, the ground floor typifies the Beaux-Arts style with many flourishes, including a rusticated base and an elaborate balcony seen here with balustrades on either side, ornate brackets underneath and a cartouche right in the middle. The cartouche can be seen more closely above, right here. It still contains the initials of the Arnold Toynbee House, the original name of the Grand Street Settlement. Down below near the door here is a plaque right here, which indicates the current function of the building. It says ritualarium, identifying the occupant as the mikvah of the Lower East Side which is a bathhouse for ritual purification in the Jewish religion. 311 East Broadway certainly has a storied history for the Lower East Side and is a remarkable architectural signpost in the neighborhood. It would be a terrible shame to lose it as it would be for the other two buildings as well. These settlement houses have played an essential role for the Lower East Side community and their very distinctive buildings stand as a testament to the contributions they have made. Lesby firmly believes that their cultural, historical, and architectural significance makes them strong candidates for landmark designation. And we very much hope to have the support of this committee in our efforts. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, first thing I wanna just say, make straight here, is that what we will support is the request for evaluation at this point, um, because we would not support designation until they actually are calendared. Um, okay. And for community board three, when that occurs, um, of course we will consider it and we will support it, but we will need to make sure that all the building owners are notified of the hearing and that they can come and have their say. So I don't know if you have spoken with any of these building owners so far in your uh, research. We've reached out to them uh, with emails and we're trying to, with uh, the uh, Education Alliance and the University of Settlement and trying to set up, uh, you know, a, a phone meeting or, or, or a Zoom meeting, something to that degree. Um, and that's, that's what we, that's, that's who we plan to uh, contact at this point. Yeah, the uh, some years ago, friends at the Lower East Side kind of wanted to uh, advocate for university settlement, and the then I don't know what what the head of it was president uh, that was supportive, but wanted to wait. And of course, he is now gone, and there's new management. So I don't know anything about how they might feel now, but they're not gonna mess with that building. And it would be uh, certainly an honor to have it designated as a landmark. Um, and again, I don't know about the edges, whether, you know, they, they made so many changes to that building and I guess they've got them done and they're not likely to do any more in, in time to come. So they might be okay too. I bet you'll have some issues with the mikvah. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're anticipating that, uh, but uh, you know, we'll just see what happens. 
in, in your presentation, you mentioned landmarks in the neighborhood. You might also mention the Bialystoker home, which is across the street. Yes, yes. Um, and it's the, the same era, and it has a similar history in that the immigrants from Bialystok raised the funds themselves, almost brick by brick, to really? build that building um, and to provide services to immigrants. They, they were, of course, interested in immigrants from Bialystok, but they helped everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't imagine any of the, the Lower East Side happening without the support of these institutions. Yeah. So when you say, would you be able, uh, would CB3 be able to write a letter uh, to the Landmarks Commission saying that CB3 supports the process of evaluating the building or something to that effect? Yes, yes, we will. We'll, we'll pass a resolution. Uh, we did Great. that last, last month for village preservation for the house at 8080 10th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll do the same for you. Um, I actually could use some help writing this resolution um, because I think there's a lot of lot of interesting facts here. I want to get at the you know I don't want a two page resolution, but I want to get at for each building something of significance for that building. So if we started with where did you begin? You began with um, with university, the university settlement. University settlement. So let's start with that. Yeah. Um, just a little bullet here. Um, something about when it was built, who its architecture was. Yeah. Should I close this screen now? Um, well, you Linda? might want to just go back to the beginning because I have oh, okay. facts right on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's also are, yeah. It's um. It's particularly noteworthy because it's the first settlement house in America, and it was um, open just three years after the. Uh, very first settlement house, which was opened in London. So Slow down. That, that's I'm all. That's, getting, I'm just getting the best basics of the architects here. Okay. Yeah, that was Howell, Howells and Stokes. Right. Yeah, I, I wrote it there. Yeah, it's on the screen. Okay. University settlement was the first settlement house in America. Yeah. It had different names before it was settled on university settlement, but it's still the first organization. Okay. What else can we say about it? Uh, architecture. Yeah, opened in 1898. I don't know if you, you say that. Got that, yeah, got that. Yeah, Howells and Stokes. It's in a neo-federal style. Mm, put that up here. Yeah, architect was built in 1898 in a neo-federal style. Mm -hmm. They don't have Mitchell, he usually. Yeah. Deal with the architecture. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> okay. actually, actually, I don't know if this goes in a resolution, but the focus on the this early American style was tied in with the idea of assimilating the immigrants as well. But I don't know if it necessarily fits in a resolution. Yeah, maybe not. But excuse me, David. David, we're having difficulty hearing you. I'm going to be very quiet now, so you can speak. I'm, uh, I'm on. I'm, I'm just uh, my um, my only. I mean, generally, the these people who own these buildings are not putting, I think, on anything major to change them. It's just too much. And the only question I have is the one that settled the Mikva settlement, is, is the Mikva building, is that. It has to serve a religious purpose, and that to make sure any restrictions that were imposed will not interfere. Should there are, there are construction problems concerning how a mikvah is made, and that these new uh, whatever have to be allowances for that to be whatever those if something happens that out that has to be fixed. Right. And well, it may, it may interfere with the landmark designation, but in order for the building to serve its purpose. Has to be able to function as the mikvah, uh, and that that's that's a um, hopefully it'll never happen, but it's a concern that I was thinking about. Oh well, that's I'm a very good point. Up. Go ahead, Richard. Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We're we're applying just for um, 
individual landmark status, which would mean that the interiors of the buildings would not be regulated in, in any way. Excuse me, I, I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, that we're applying- I just didn't hear the word clearly, that's all. Oh yeah, uh, we're applying for individual landmark status, meaning that the buildings um, would not, the interiors of the buildings would not be regulated by the, by the Landmarks Commission. And so they would only be concerned really with the exterior of the buildings and really with just what's visible from the street. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's generally, the general generally rule. Can, as, as, you, as you understand, the, it, it is an internal construction that, that, that's relevant here. Right. So uh, it may be sufficient, but mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, that generally, David, when there's a religious building involved, the Landmarks Commission is pretty careful to avoid anything that would interfere with the interior of the building. Okay. But it, it, is, a, it is an important point. Okay, where is University? The first settlement house in America, neo-federal style. I guess I, won't, I guess I won't make your wonderful point because it might make me too wordy. Yeah, so, um, should, should, should we say anything about the fact that um, uh, Although a, a sixth floor was added, you know, early on, it, it did. It, the you know the building is basically intact. Yes, and it, I, I it's kind of remarkably intact. <laughs> Change in wait. We can't all talk at once. We might have to start raising our hands. <laughs> yeah. So this building. Um, was this were those changes made in 1905? Well, that the photograph is 1905, so it was somewhere between okay. 1898 and 1905. Yeah, really early. Yeah, and they, and they did a compatible uh, design for the sixth floor, I think. Yeah, the design is compatible and it does not take away from the basic. Um, I don't need to say that design was compatible. Was it, uh, Richard had said original conception of the building. Yeah. That's, that's enough. Do you think that's enough for that yeah. one? Okay. The next building. Okay. Uh, edgy. Okay. Whereas. The educational alliance. Did we say something about the fine level of the architectural detailing and the architecture or something like that? Sure. But for the that university settlement? For, for all three of the buildings, but I, I think it's I think it's an important point in terms of you know what should be considered when landmarking is being considered. Okay. They give me give me that sentence. Oh gosh, you know that uh, once I say those things, it just- You gotta repeat them. <laughs> <laughs> that, the, that, the, that the building is noteworthy for uh, not only its, its overall architectural design, but the fine quality of, of, its, of its detailing. But that's kind of a broad statement. It applies to all of the buildings. It really right? does. That's, that, that, that's what I was thinking we just probably, repeat it each time. Right. We're just going to say things. so each time. That's okay. 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 Let's let's do the edgies. Um, so, was was the Educational Alliance founded in 1891, or was no. it founded founded early. earlier? This was their new building. Let's see if I've got the founding date here. Oh. Um, um, It was founded in 1889. Yeah. So they got they got their money together right away. There were a lot of rich people, weren't there, that yeah. out down there. Yeah, these were the, the prosperous uh, German Jewish immigrants who had come yeah. the generation earlier and really had uh, succeeded financially for sure. So it, it's we should say uh, a kind word, a kind word for Henry Street settlement, which whereas everything is already landmarked, but they are amazing. Oh, they are. They They're, are. They have their whole purpose in life that they do beautifully, and they care for their landmark buildings beautifully. So 
Yeah, I know it. And they've just, they've expanded their services. So they're even, yeah. They were a little later. They were um, 1893. It's all around this time though. They were all, yeah, all of this stuff, all of these, the library, the park, all of these things happened within about 10 years. I know it was the progressive era trying to, you know, solve the situations in the in the cities in particular. Yeah. Runner and Tryon. What what specifically would we like to say about it? Can we say it uh, combines elements of the Romanesque revival and Renaissance revival styles? Combines elements of the say that again. Um, it combines elements of the Romanesque revival and Renaissance revival styles. Amazing, I spell Renaissance right. Should, should, should. That's, a, that's a word I always get wrong. I miss either the two ends or the, oh, there aren't two ends. The word just corrected it nicely for me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Richard, should, Richard, should we say anything like about um, with the bold arches or anything like that? I just say the thing about the styles. That's enough. Yeah, I think, I think again, just saying, you know, there's a, a high quality uh, architectural design. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's that's enough. Okay. Let's say, whereas the architectural design and details, details are of a high quality. I can see I'm going to rearrange this resolution a little bit, but that won't be a problem. Yeah. It needs to be, you know, it's different because we're talking about three different buildings. Mm -hmm. quality okay and um so this one had an early edition too you know that element on the east of this, you know right here i don't yes, know if yes. that's significant to mention but that's in a style that you can you know you, it's like a matching style yeah let's see the building was expanded to the east yeah to the east uh, in a compatible uh, architectural style. Do we know when that happened? Well, again, th these are vague. Like we, we, I'm going. We're going by the photographs, <laughs> and <laughs> the photograph. This photograph is estimated to be between 1901 and 1906. I'll say in the early 1900s. Yeah. Okay. Very, very good. Now, the mikva, the ma that magnificent building. Everybody, did, did we say that? Did we say anywhere that the buildings remain um, remarkably intact from their original construction? Do we say that somewhere? Yeah, not, not precisely. No, where he is, the building is remarkably intact. No. I, I would say that also for the university settlement as well, mm. despite yeah. modest changes over time. Yeah. Even the modern ones, except for that, I don't care for that entrance. I must say, yeah, I that so it's, it's a little jarring it. when you when you see the old ones. Yeah, totally unnecessary for them to do that. Yeah, um, um, and then the three eleven East Broadway. Yeah. Three one one Broadway. Let's let's give a little bit of its history was originally, let's say it was, well, it was built in 1905, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was really built by the Young Men's Benevolent Association. Architects. Small Heiser. Okay. And now we've got to say something about the architecture of this building. This one is it com combines the Flemish revival style and the and the Beaux Arts style. That hardly gets it out. <laughs> the Flemish revival. And the Beaux Arts style. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
should we can we say anything like right? can we say anything? We say the architecture of, or the exuberant architecture. Yeah, exuberant. Well, it's 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 exuberance. Could we say something like to the effect it's exuberance uh, was noted from the time that it opened? You know, like it was the new, two newspapers commented on that. Is it, it's uh, exuberant effect was uh, recognized by newspapers uh, immediately. You know, newspapers of the day. Excuse me for a moment. Uh, this is David here. I just want you you mentioned one of the, about the architects. I don't know if you want to show anything about the architect in any of the buildings you're mentioning as the importance for landmarking. Uh, I did I did put that in. I just didn't make a point of it. Do you know something about those architects? No, no. I just as well because you mentioned one of them was. Uh, I don't know how many buildings that they, he made the, the, the Jewish style for Jewish organizations, but how many are still extant and uh, how relevant or his, his work was and what these represent is, is what's left of them. We, we did put some of that in the actual full, you know, request for evaluation. Well, um, you were all part of the resolution was, too, I don't know. Okay, see what else do we want to say? Um, I guess we should say something about the alterations. Boy, I wish they hadn't alterated that top there. I know, I know. I guess they, they become, first of all, they be, these buildings become unstable and things like the, uh, the little fancy whatever is on the top of it on the left. They could become loose, you mean, and fall yeah, off? Yeah, could it become dangerous? Yeah. And so they they remove them, you know. Yeah. What if we say that although although the building you know has lost uh, portions of its ornament, uh, the 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 majority of the architectural features remain intact. Okay. Or most, instead of a majority, most most of the architectural features remain remain completely intact. Yep. Yep. This has to be in their database somewhere, right? <laughs> From some previous survey. Okay. Let me say, therefore, be it resolved. I'll go back and read you this. Community Board 3 supports for evaluation for these significant buildings of significant, let's see, I think for these three buildings, cultural, historical, historic, and architectural significance. Mm -hmm. Besides, they're in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and they're in your neighborhood, David. <laughs> well, uh, I've actually, I have, I've used at least two of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been to all three. I got to think about the settlement houses over there. It's a little further, far from me, but uh, <laughs> I've definitely walked by and admired it. I'll put it in that. Yeah. Well, that qualify as use? <laughs> that qualifies. The community board three, uh, you know, before pre pre COVID, we had a lot of meetings at university settlement, and we had a chance to really get to know that building. Oh wow, that's Quite great. Amazing. I've only been there a lot times. Of we'll come again. Yeah. They have a very nice facility. All right, so what I think I should do with this resolution, um, I'll just start up at the top. The first says motion to support for reasons of both history and architecture, and I should help say culture, history, and architecture. Mm -hmm. Reasons of culture, history, and architecture, the request for evaluation 
Oh, well, it says to support for reasons of <laughs> culture, history, and architecture, the request for evaluation for university settlement, and I give the address, Educational <laughs> Alliance, and the former Young Men's Benevolent Association, currently mixed of the Lower East Side. Should you add that it became the Grand Street Settlement in there? Uh, sure. Yeah. Later, the Young Men's Benevolent Association, later the Grand Street Settlement. Yeah. And, and presently, the mikvah of the Lower East Side. Yep. Mm -hmm. Presently. Presently, the mikvah of the Lower East Side, 311 East Broadway. Then it says, whereas settlement houses are integrated, integral to the history of the Lower East Side as new immigrants were assisted in learning English and finding their way in a new land. And whereas each of the settlement houses is architecturally interesting. And then I think I should have, instead of a whole bunch of little short whereases, I think I should have some bullet points and say, whereas university settlement, and then put some bullets under it, was built in 1898 in the neo-federal style, is noteworthy for the fine quality of its detailing. Um, we have the first settlement house in America. Design and detailing. So it's the first settlement house in America. Say that again, Richard. Can we say the fine quality of its architectural design and detailing? Sure, we can say that. <laughs> architectural. I can't spell that. Sure. Wait for spell check to do it for you. You know, the spell check is amazing. It does it on the fly. You know, I, I could see I had a word wrong and then it immediately changed it. The building is noteworthy for the fine quality of its architectural design and detailing. Its architecture. If you have tried to something in Hebrew and, 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 and anglicize it, and you and you be surprised what you come up with. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, built in a. I'm going to I'm going to put the architects up by in the first line. So it was built in 1899 in a neo-federal style by the architects. Mm. 1898, yeah. Yeah, 1898. I don't yeah. know what I said. Architect Halloween Stokes. There, that's better. Then I can get rid of that line completely. Um, was the first settlement house in America. Um, whereas although a sixth floor was added sometime between 1900, before 1906, I think that's supposed to say. Yeah. For 1905, the design is, is compatible and does not interfere with the original conception of the building. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Educational Alliance, I'm the next, next one, built in 1899. Uh, uh, it says founded in 1899, eight, founded in 1889, built in 1891. Architects by the architects, Runner and Tryon. Mm -hmm. I, should, I should share this resolution and you guys could see my thinking and progress here. <laughs> and Tryon. Oops, Runner went away. I was trying to think what else Runner built. Um, he, you know, he, he and Tryon built that. There's a building of, that's now used by Pratt on West 14th Street. It's a really handsome building. Um, but I also, in my folder, I have a lot of other buildings. I just can't think of them right now. Oh, that's okay. Just, it's, it's, it, the name has come up before in, in connection with Sewer and Park, but also in other yeah. cases. Um, Did you know he had done the fountain, Linda? Yes, I knew that. Yeah. yeah. The, that fountain. He seemed, to, yeah. he seemed to. He seemed to. is trying to raise money to yeah. bring that fountain back to life. Um, so he seemed to. You guys, yeah. If you have any money, you yeah. send it our way. <laughs> he seemed to have been a favorite of Jacob Schiff. Yeah, yes, he, I believe he gave the money. He provided the money to build it. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was. And we've, we tried to prevail on some members of the Schiff family that are lurking around. Uh, to see if they would like to come up with the money, but they seem to not be at all interested. Hmm. Um, of course, 
the parks department removed all the, the you know the fancy stuff at the top of the fountain yeah and uh, lost it they always lose it oh dear so that all has to be re remanufactured and you know we have good drawings that's that's the mm -hmm. only thing we can say but, yeah it's too bad mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing you know it's probably three million dollar job and it's hard to come up with that kind of money yeah sugar daddy somewhere right okay Although uh, a sixth floor was added sometime before 1905, the design is compatible and does not interfere with the original conception, architectural conception. Yeah, architectural conception, yeah. Conception of the building. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Uh, building contains elements of the Romanesque revival and Renaissance revival styles. Mm -hmm. Architectural design and details are of a high quality. Mm -hmm. The building is remarkably intact despite modest changes over time. And we're up to the mitzvah. Is there anything else I should say about the edges other than that? I think that sounds good. Richard? Uh, no, but uh, something came to my mind. Maybe I'll just I'll just throw it out there if it's all right. Hey, do it. Um, you know, I, I, maybe somewhere, maybe at the end or something of all of them, it could say that, you know, that these these buildings are um, exceptionally uh, or, or tell an exceptionally important story about uh, the history of the Lower East Side, the history of immigration into our nation, and- um, Slow down. <laughs> what's that? I'm, 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 I'm typing what you're saying. Oh. Okay. I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Exceptional, tell an exceptional story. Okay, um, continue. Or the, these buildings, um, Oh gosh, yeah. I, I wish I wish these ideas wouldn't just run away from me when I. Uh... Let me, um, Deborah. If you would stop sharing your screen. Okay. I'll, I'll put this on the shared screen. And show yeah. how, how much trouble I have with Shane's mm -hmm. screen sharing. Okay, maybe Richard. Maybe you want to talk about uh, the building. Speak to the iconic settlement of of. Um, iconic settlement of Eastern European Jews on the Lower East Side. Is that what you're trying to say, Richard? Well, I'm trying to make a, a little yeah. broader just in terms of immigration into the Lower East Side and into our nation as opposed to, you know, leaving it as, as a more targeted thing. Right. Um, like, for, for example, fostering the assimilation of okay. immigrants. Yeah. Yes. I mean, assimilation is a very loaded term these days. Yeah, so it is. Yeah. Let's not Adaptation. Yeah. Right. Okay, or, I'm on this. I'm on this. Whereas at the end here, I, I think it's an exceptionally important story. I th yeah, tell an exceptionally important story um, of of uh, life life in the Lower East Side, immigration into our city, and, and immigration into our city and country. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this well, all this not an exceptional story, but exceptionally important story. Yeah, an exceptionally mm -hmm. important story. Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. Why is it paused? It says my screen sharing is paused, but it does not tell me why. <laughs> no wonder you're saying you don't know what. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I think we got it. I like this resolution. I will I will pretty it up. Um, closed. Where did my where did my document go? There it is. All right. Um, if you think of anything else that we should say, um, I think we said a similar set of things about each building. We mm -hmm. talked talked about the culture. We talked about the history. We talked about the architecture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, David, I mean, I thought we, sh we probably should say something about the significance uh, for Jewish immigrants to the Lower East Side, right? 
Well, that's what they were for. What? What? See, I, I, I don't know the full historical context, but this was one wave of who the previous wave of Jewish immigrants helping the next wave. I don't know how common or repetitive that was among Jew, the waves of people that came over. Did, did, did they? Did they? Uh, I mean, they didn't look to rely on the government. They looked to rely on themselves. Right. Right. I don't know if that's also something you could say today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was the concept then that they were not looking for the government to give them the, 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 the what they needed. Mm-hmm. They were looking for themselves, and they saw from their from their people from the for the co religionist they mm-hmm. they sought to support them, you know, mm-hmm. in and in, in not have them rely on the government. You know, it was today true. Today, get me into a lot of trouble. Well, you know, it was true of the other immigrant groups, too, like the Germans when they came and the Irish when they came. They had the Italians, the mutual aid, okay. mutual aid society. I don't, I don't know to, the, to this level, to this degree. Yeah. But we could say something like uh, speaks to the importance of, um, of community uh, at, this po- at, this, at this point in the lower, uh, at this point of time in the Lower East Side. Mm-hmm. To the important oh, I, 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 okay. well, that's maybe that's too general. The, I um, don't know, but they, as I say, this is you, you're not going to, you know, this is not the, not the mindset today in today's uh, communities. That's for sure. Just, well, I don't think anybody, no, I don't know. I don't know if anybody would object to just saying, you know, the importance of community. It's, I'm going to say something that happened maybe 30 years, 25 years ago. There was a, um, they had, they had, in, in when this first started, they had the, uh, you know, they tried to identify and to appreciate all the different cultures that came to in America and all that. And uh, they, so when they came to the Jewish one, I, I always liked what, um, what Mark Twain said. And when he went and the way about the survival of the Jewish people, I was amazed by it because they were just so dispersed and spread out. And I was told that 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 could be offensive to people, and that they didn't want to include that into the presentations. Hmm. So when you talk about this, well, we don't want to we don't I, want to turn anybody off. That's for sure. I'm just saying is when you're talking about this and how you want to say how how. They recognized the the, the the help without going to the government. I don't know how how it's going to be taken today. I really, I mean, John F. Kennedy may be turning over in his speeches. You know, it's kind of interesting because a lot of the programs they came up with, then the government adopted those programs. Yeah, but yeah, so they really. The, they, pro- they, the problem. The problem is, is that uh, think you know. About Seward Park. Think about Seward Park Library. Both of those existed. Privately before the city took them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying is that I. You may want to put the resolution, but I, but there's only I think only so far you can go in saying things like this, mm-hmm. before it, it, you may have people change. You know, turn turning people off in a way. Well, I mean, it's it's a historic fact, isn't it? <laughs> since since we get facts that in the way of emotion. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. I'll, I'll, so I don't know. So I, I appreciate the, the concept and that we can discuss it here, but I don't know how far you want to take it. That's all. That's all I'm saying. That's okay. all I'm what happened 25 years ago. It was hitting. It was. It was. It was. It was, it was making an effect. We appreciate your uh, carefulness here. So we'll be careful too. Okay. So we support it. Um. And uh, this was a great presentation. I learned a lot. You know, I know the buildings and uh, <laughs> I see them every day, but uh, as always, Deborah, you come up with some interesting facts. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, it was really a great presentation. Oh, um, thank you, Sandra. Learned a lot. Yeah. yeah. Learned a lot. Um, my, family, my family's been here for 75 years on the Lower East Side on Bloom Street, and I know these buildings very well. Went to you know, 134 right next to the 311 East Broadway. And uh, 
I just, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Oh, thank you. I guess we feel like, I mean, if anything happened to these buildings, it would just be awful, you know? Yeah, yeah I, well, I think that one of the good things is nothing's going to happen to these buildings. Um, no, we're, we're trying, we're trying present, to honor them. Not from the present occupants. Not right. from the present occupants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. I can't, yeah. I can't imagine uh, the edgies. I don't know about the mix, but maybe they want to sell the building when it gets really valuable. I don't know. Yeah, uh, the thing is, the cost of replacement would be prohibiting that. They would have to have to, uh, in order to have the Jewish community need the, what the services the mission provides, and they would no way. I mean, the replacement cost may be just as expensive as whatever else they want to do with it. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad to know that. <laughs> yeah, Linda, glad to hear. I, Linda, I thought they were looking at at one point uh, that entire row. Right there. Oh yes, that's uh, well, we are. We we actually proposed it as a district to the LPC back what five years ago, Richard. Yeah. And uh, they 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 wrote a letter back, and it wasn't the they do not rise to the level of blah 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 letter. It was oh, okay. well, that's very interesting. We'll consider it someday. So, you know, we shouldn't give up on that. Um, we, we're sorry, of course, we've lost some buildings so already. Yeah. There's a, there's a big hole in that row. Mm -hmm. our, our feeling is that nothing surprises us when it comes to destruction in the Lower East Side, so. Well, we'll you know, we'll the, first. The, the tendency of the city to want to build taller and taller um, that becomes so attractive to developers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these small three-story buildings are really in danger. Mm -hmm. It really could be anything. I mean, we're seeing buildings in the city come down that are 20, 30, 40 stories, which has actually been the case now for 100 years since the single yeah, building. This is true. This is true. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. So but it's you, easy. Mean to, you mean to make them even higher? <laughs> yeah, or different. You know, yeah. it's, it's very weird. Yeah, it's it's. I think we ought to begin to talk about how uh, ecologically unsound it is to demolish an old building and replace it with a new one. What the cost to the well, environment of doing that? Depends upon the structure of the building. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, you know, it's a you're you're destroying a lot of good materials, and mm -hmm. that has a cost. It has an environmental cost. Plus, you're using uh, light and air, which is something that you really want to have these days. With these you absolutely know, pandemics yeah. that we're all too too familiar with at this point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we should vote on our resolution, folks, and then uh, we're done. So, would someone like to move? And someone like to second? I'll move. Okay. To adopt the resolution. Will you second, David? I'll second, yeah. All right. Okay, all in favor. Aye. 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 Done. Um, I, I do want have to do a like question a for Richard. Against. <laughs> I can't do that yet. Richard. I, 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 I do have a question for Richard. When you yes. uh, spoke about Chinatown uh, earlier, you said you had or did do or do not have the support of the council. No, we do not have the support of, of, oh, of Margaret Chin. No. Right. Oh, the current. Right. Okay. She would good. like to preserve. So she would like to preserve Chinatown um, using some kind of a land trust, but I, I understand that there's been opposition to that too. So that uh, that's on indefinite hold. Uh, and my experience is that they any effort to preserve anything has run up against you know suspicion by the property owners. Um, I, th I know there was a, pro a proposal to make it a special district once, some sort of like the Little Italy special district, which would be quite a lot of protection, uh, but the property owners weren't having it. Yeah, I think we just have to keep at it, as, but in, in the most strategic way. Uh, it may possible. be that the younger members of, the f of these families that own these buildings will take a different attitude. That's what I'm finding. I'm finding that there, you know, uh, just uh, having been around Chinatown more in the last couple of years, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm seeing actual much more interest in preservation and 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 and, and history of Chinatown uh, among the young, you know, the younger generation, which is not unusual. No. You know, where you get a few generations removed 
from the first generation that came here, including my own family was like that. My great grandmother had no interest in the history. Yeah. So I, could, I hate to say it wasn't they, history that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. they, and they, you know, those, those original <laughs> owners scraped together the money to buy those buildings and have a, a base for their families. Right. And yeah, they mm -hmm. they want to have complete control over that property. Right. So right. Yeah, but so, uh, and 70 Mulberry Street issue did bring out <laughs> quite a few Chinatown residents who want to save that building. And I was, <laughs> I was actually, some, but they were all young folks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very and emotional. Under about forty, it. <laughs> mm. but very well, emotional about thing, it. Very dedicated. Yeah, yeah. Well, the good thing is that the council will be changing this year, but right? not so, always for the better. Are we having some sort of uh, forum for our potential council people? There's quite a lot of people. Running. Yeah, we are. We are actually. Is that scary? I actually bumped into Gigi today. Yeah, uh, nine people running. Well, I know. Yeah, Grant Street Gems uh, does. Uh, had a forum about a month ago. All right. Sure they, yeah, they'll right. probably. But, but we need that. one that's specifically oriented toward preservation. Um, which yeah, is that's, not what a subject that's what we're that doing up, right now. Yeah, in the general forums. Oh, oh. I would great be idea. To hear what some of them say. I mean, I, I'm i sure Gigi, Gigi is supportive of preservation, but I don't know if she would any more than Margaret go up against all the Chinatown property owners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that would be hard for Christopher Marte to do. He's not even Chinese. I mean, this it's a tough, a tough but he has a great thing. he has a good connection uh with uh Chinatown, Chinese Planning Council. A number of them no, no. have um backed him, works. right? Have endorsed him. So mm. I'll come to <laughs> well we'll see. So you let us know okay. when this this forum is scheduled and I'll make sure to publicize it because I think we should all pay attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so someone can move turn. Well, thank you everyone, everyone so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank, yeah. thank so you much. for a great presentation. Come back when you have some more. I know you're working on other things. <laughs> That's for thank sure. you for your emails. Thank <laughs> you for your emails. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not feeling too good today. My voice is kind of shot, but thank you for your emails. And Linda and I even went on your walking tours uh, before. So I um, really did. thank you for the work you do. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, you guys are, you, especially with the Zoom uh, lectures, it's been, really been great. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. So good night. Do any good work night. on those, those couple of buildings in Chinatown? We would love to know about that. Yeah, Barry's oh. working on those. Yeah. Yeah, so good. Okay. Okay, good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.